and I must uh, thank Dr. Ingal Halikar for uh, including me in this team. Sir has been my teacher to learn orthopedic pains when I just started my pain management. So I'm going to focus on the pains rather than the interventions to treat them. So the common neck and radicular pains in orthopedic practice are discogenic radiculopathy. But if you look at it, these indicate not dermatomes, but actually myotomes in practice. Facetogenic pains, which actually manifest as myofascial pains. What you see here, demarcated as three, four, five, six, etc., actually represents the muscles which underlie these areas. These things I have discovered from my experience with patients, though this is what is written in textbooks. And myofascial pains per se, like the dreaded trapezitis, levetoscapulae syndrome, rhomboid issues, etc. All these, of course, their pain referral areas comes from the underlying muscles. Muscles are the final common pathway for expressions of all types of pains. And this is a blanket statement after 15 years of pain management. Cervical spine is the most mobile part of the spine. There is maximum wear and tear. Nerve roots, as they go through the intervertebral foramina, are vulnerable to injury. And patients, that this is the reason why we see patients who are presenting with radicular pain, classical radicular pains, but MRI will be normal. So we sort of call it as cervical spondylosis and uh, give them analgesics or whatever. So these have secondary manifestations like frozen shoulder, tennis elbow, deep ver veins, trigger finger, all the upper extremity pains in the radicular distribution from C1 to T1. So when I see a spine like this, straight spine, it is the hallmark of long-standing paravertebral muscle spasm. And this spasm is very real. It is not secondary. It is a primary feature of all disc and facet pathologies. It leads to constant friction and microtrauma to the nerves at the root foramen, causing incipient radiculopathy. This is the spondylosis. There is no disc, but there is a radiculopathy. This nerve root irritation causes spasm of muscles supplied by that particular nerve root. This constant spasm, how does it generate pain? That it does by generating myofascial trigger points. If I were to go into the detail, this is muscle knots which form where actin and myosin stick to each other. And after a while, they become spontaneously painful and any movement of the muscle becomes painful. So once formed, these myofascial trigger points also have motor effects in that they cause taut bands in the muscles. These taut bands shorten the muscle. This leads to secondary issues at the tendon and tenosynovitis and other, they keep pulling at the ends, causing burning, pain, so many shocks, all neuropathic pain symptoms are actually mediated by muscles. And tenosynovitis is actually the reason for complex regional pain syndrome manifestations. When you look at complex regional pain syndrome like this, it becomes an eminently treatable pain condition. Later, the constant spasm brings the vertebrae together to compress the discs and facets. If this is the normal disc, normal facet, then muscles across the discs shorten. They will compress the disc and they will cause facet arthralgia. In addition, what it does is it compresses the disc and impinges on the nerve root. This irritated nerve has an anterior root which causes the radicular pain for you. And this dorsal root, which has the median and lateral branch, will supply the neck muscles, back muscles, etc. Eventually, this pressure leads to disc herniation. 
So it is not the disc herniation which causes the muscle spasm, but the muscle spasm which leads to disc pathologies. And once that happens, this precipitates very severe muscle spasm. This is much, much more compared to the original spasm that precipitated the disc. And this leads to secondary effects of radiculopathy in all these muscles which you see. Disc issues will cause radiculopathy, synovial irritation, facet arthropathy, and painful spasm of muscles. So these MTRPs become autonomous sources of pain. They persist even after the disc heals. They cause the residual pa pains that persist after an epidural. Failed interventions. And most importantly, they are the reason for failed surgeries. Our surgeons are good. They will do a fantastic surgery, but the patient comes back and says, my pain is worse, or my pain is as it was, or I have a different pain. It is because of this myofascial component, which is swept under the carpet all the time. So this has to be addressed, along with epidural injection. Fortunately, they are exquisitely sensitive to a treatment called dry needling. When you add ultrasound visualization to dry needling, it shows visible pain as muscle shimmers and twitches on ultrasound. MTRPs can be visualized, etc. So these are images of ultrasound-guided dry needling and ultrasound-guided Botox injections, which are very, very useful. Now, coming to the what I was supposed to speak about, cervical epidural injections can be interlaminar or transforaminal. Transforaminal is contraindicated because of the risks of hitting vertebral arteries very high with dissection, and radicular arteries can be hit with embolization of particulate steroid. So one anonymous survey showed 13 fatalities and 78 complications. That is enough to contraindicate this. Nobody wants this kind of complications. Epidural injection, can I continue? Yeah. yeah. Cervical epidural space is widest, four millimeter at C7, T1, and T12. Neck flexion widens it, so prone position with the neck flexed, and caudat tilt allows a good visualization of the interlaminar space. And ligamentum flavum is thicker laterally, so you hit the epidural space at a deeper level. And when you cannot really make out, an uh, oblique view can show you where your needle tip target is. This is a video I took. It is after you enter the supraspinous ligament that the needle gets fixed like this. And we go like this with loss of continuous pressure on the syringe. This is with saline. You get a loss of resistance. Yeah. So that, that loss of resistance, that plunge you're going in is the loss of resistance. And then you pass a catheter to wherever you want. Make sure that the dye spread is going where we want it, C5, C6, whatever. Superficial. Sorry. So this is what an optimal dye spread looks like in the cervical region. And when you see a spread like this, this is a muscular spread. Cervical facet, I think, I'm out of time. So questions. cervical facet procedures, I, I hardly ever do them these days because when you address the myofascial system, these pains disappear. So thank you very much for this.